want to go ahead and get started. It's 8 o'clock. We run a prompt ship around here. I want to thank everybody for coming. My name is Debbie Brinkman. I'm mayor of Littleton. And uh, on behalf of the entire city council, we want to thank you guys for being here today. I want to introduce a few council members that are here. Pat Driscoll in the back. Uh, Karina Elrod. Carol Fay. And I think I'll hear a yell if I forgot someone. No, nope. got everybody. Um, we have a number of members of our staff here. City manager, Mark Ralph. Deputy City Manager, Randy Young. Public Works Director, Keith Reister. Community Development Director, Jocelyn Mills. Um, oh gosh, there's a number of other ones. <laughs> Run through it. Well, again, we want to thank you guys for being here today. And um, I think that you're going to have, um, hopefully, a very interesting morning. Um, want to just kind of give you a little bit of information in terms of why this is uh, important, um, why this is something that we wanted you to um, get some information on. The council is working on a no number of initiatives. Uh, those include working on um, our comp plan and our vision, and we're calling it vision to plan to code. And the vision exercise is being conducted right now and we're reaching out to the community we're having really really good response we've gotten over I think over 800 different sur surveys have been filled out we have tens of thousands of impressions that we've made around the community hundreds of events that we've hold held and gotten a lot of input from the community in terms of what they want to be you know that what's their vision for their Littleton this, all of this information will be, uh, is being kind of churned through and will be the foundation for the comp plan. The comp plan is really the guiding document for the planning and development in the community. We have our, zo our zoning rules and laws, and but the comp plan kind of decides what the community wants to do and where it wants to go. So we have a very, very old comp plan that we've been working on for a very, very long time, and this council has said we're going to finish it. It stops with this council. We will get it done. It will be ratified. So we're on a pretty fast track for that. Um, it will be ratified next November, so a year from, about a year from today, <laughs> from this time, um, we will be ratifying it. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And a lot of that is, is, is community involvement, community engagement, and also participation and engagement from our businesses, very important. Um, we're really, really blessed in Littleton to have the downtown that we have. Um, the fact that we have been able to, the, the core of that downtown, the foundation of that downtown, it's hundreds of years old, not hundreds, but over a hundred years old. And over time, businesses and the community have built on that. And the downtown we see today is the downtown that has been built over time. 15, 18 years ago, it did not look like that. Um, I moved here about 18 years ago, and it was, there was a uh, a sandwich shop and a Mexican restaurant and a fondue place and then a bunch of other little things that were somewhat um, nondescript. There were a lot of little antique stores. There were a lot. Of, so it was not a place where people flock to. And the market and entrepreneurs and business people and shop owners and creative thinkers um, saw saw something in that and said, you know what, this is a good place for us to plant. And they did, and you're here today. And so the downtown we have today is not the downtown we'll have in 20 years or the downtown we'll have in 30 years. It evolves and it should, the same way that the city evolves and changes and should. But it needs to be in the right direction and not evolve, not a devolve, but an evolve. Um, this weekend, one of my favorite things to do is to bring friends downtown. And this weekend, I brought a bunch of girlfriends down, and I brought another one of them was another mayor of a neighboring community. And um, yeah, we shopped up and down the streets, and I made them spend a lot of money. Thank you, Rooted. <laughs> um, but the comment that the mayor said to me as we were driving off that she goes, I really, really really don't know how to do this in my community. 
We need this. This is so important, and I just am so jealous that you guys have this. That is something I hear all the time. Communities that do not have what we have are struggling with how do we do that. Well, you, you don't create it. You support it. And this is an opportunity for us to show that support. We need to look towards the future, without a doubt. Um, council, obviously, is, is doing that with the community, with our visioning, with our outreach, and the eventual comp plan ratification. And a healthy and thriving downtown is absolutely priority. Um, there are a lot of challenges um, facing communities these days. We just went through three different nights of budget hearings, and we are dealing with some pretty incredible challenges in our community in terms of being able to support the needs, the infrastructure needs. We have over $100 million in infrastructure needs that we are currently unfunded. Uh, we're able to continue to support crucial services. We're not broke, but communities are really facing aging infrastructure, coming up out of a recession, um, trying to just keep the maintenance going. So there are big issues facing communities. It's not just Littleton, but this is what we're dealing with. And so it's becoming more and more important over time for us to figure out how to do, um, how to support each other and how to look at options and alternatives. So again, I thank you so much for your participation today, for being here, for being interested, for being engaged. Thank you for your support of our community with your businesses. Um, I want to briefly introduce our um, facilitator and primary speaker this morning. Where is Oh, behind me, okay. And then um, we have an have a, a excellent team of speakers who will be joining her. I'll let her introduce them. Um, this is Kath, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've just, Catherine Corral. She's executive director for Downtown Colorado, Inc. She's an innovative creative strategist who has served as a resource choreographer for local governments, nonprofits, and private businesses hoping to achieve more with less. She's born and raised in Denver. Always love to <laughs> go for the natives. I'm native too. Catherine has worked with development initiatives in Denver, New York, Chicago, and the former Soviet Union. Her experience is broad and vast, and we're really fortunate to have her here today. I look forward to hearing from Catherine and our other guests this morning, and I hope you do too. Please give Catherine a warm Littleton welcome. All right, thank you, Mayor Brinkman, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, thank you to Mark Ralph, who we uh, crossed paths at uh, Colorado Municipal League, and I think that's where a lot of these ideas came through. I was um, also really pleased to be in Littleton for um, the creative placemaking session of your Littleton Leadership Academy last year. And um, I, I've really been impressed with a lot of the things that you're doing um, in terms of planning, building that leadership, um, helping to shape the vision. So thank you for having me back. Um, I, I'm going to go kind of fast because I want to make sure that we have time for a lot of questions and I want to be very respectful of your time this morning. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about downtown management and figure out how to move forward with it. Um, and, and thinking about just what um, the mayor was talking about. The idea that you have a very special place. I actually get calls from other communities and they say, well, what kind of management system do they use in Littleton? Because that's what we want. And I was like, you know, I think, I think theirs is kind of just naturally evolving. It, um, you guys uh, definitely have businesses that show a lot of love to the downtown. You've taken on great initiatives with your branding, your signage. Um, you have definitely shown this love of place. But thinking about how you do that, and one of my, one of my favorite um, little anecdotes is from Kimberly McKee, who runs the Downtown Development Authority in Longmont. And she always says, you know, I said to the council, you go buy a house, fix that house up, wait 30 years, and try and sell it. The downtown 
wouldn't sell either. You have to always keep that maintenance going. You always have to keep that vision going. You have to evolve, as the mayor said. It's not a one and done. It's not we're going to do this and then we can check it off. It's something that you have to do all of the time. So I think that this is a very forward-thinking um, request for, for us to be here today. And I'd like to just shape this as the first step in a journey. It is not a finished project. It's something that you continue to do throughout the, the life of your community. And that evolution is a very important um, idea. So thank you to the mayor for, for sharing her vision. Um, and so you've done a lot to celebrate the past and to, to celebrate where you are now. Um, I, I love the, the signs that you have. And I love that your, your downtown sign program really celebrates the history. And it shows where, where those things took place and what they look like today. Um, so kudos to you. And so as we embark on this process, I, I just wanted to bring up this slide because this is, I think this is really where we're at. Like you have a lot of dedicated folks that are putting a lot of effort into making your downtown the vibrant place from the people planning um, your, your art walk to the different murals to the different things that are going on. But when you think about the separate people, how do you bring them together? How do you bring them together under one umbrella so that that all of their efforts can be layered and have a bigger impact on the overall downtown. That is how you think about doing more with less. So if you can combine those resources, if you can have one strategy that all the different entities can take a part in um, implementing, you actually get more done with less. And so when we look at these different financing and different management systems, we want to start off with what you have. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see in communities is that they'll start off and they'll say, hey, what downtown management tool does Littleton have? That's what we want. No, you don't start by picking the tool. Start by understanding the job. Right? So thinking about what you have is really thinking about what stage is your downtown in. What are the general conditions? Um, and then think about what are the organizational components that you would like to drive forward with. So this is just to give you an idea of the range of what kind of the way that we look at downtowns. And this is, um, this is a, a a system that is put together by one of our, one of my, my board member organizations is Progressive Urban Management, and they do a lot with downtown management systems um, internationally and in the United States. Um, but thinking about are you stagnant, are you growing, are you mature, and then what your community needs. Um, is it, are, are we looking at parking revenue, parking management? Do you consider yourselves having a parking problem? Right? In our world, the communities with a parking problem are the lucky ones. Right? There's all those communities that really wish they had a parking problem. Um, there's people who plan for a parking problem, but they're really not there. Um, so thinking about where you are is the first step in figuring out what you need. And then shaping your priorities around that. So. Um, Retaining and growing business, I would venture to say you're probably more on the mature end as a downtown. Um, you've got a lot going for you. Managing new investment, how are, you, how are you welcoming in new property owners? How are you welcoming in new businesses? How are you attracting businesses that are going to complement what you already have here? Um, thinking about how you're um, marketing to your consumers, the parking management, um, refreshing and making sure that your downtown and the communications and the relationships that you have with your business, your property owners, your customers, all stays fresh. And really keeping that image fresh and strong and positive and always evolving as well. And then talking about what you need. So I was really glad to hear that you're working on a comp, um, a comp plan update and that you're having good, um, good re responses to your outreach and engagement. I think that this is a primary piece of what you want to think about and think about how 
you do it on multi-levels. So oftentimes when people want to do engagement, it's let's do a survey. But are there things that you can actually spur activity in your downtown and get people, you know, relating to one another and having fun and talking about the future? There's a different ways um, to solve problems and to get engagement and to also create momentum for whatever comes out of that planning process. If you do things like this, so this is a this is a, a very famous example, um, but, but some of these where you can just kind of put something out there and people can respond to it and share their ideas um, is also a way to think about how you would move forward with a different type of downtown management system and what you would structure it to support. Um, so start with what you have. Um, and then find the right tool for the job. I'll keep this very brief. Um, so we're going to have presentations today from Golden Downtown Development Authority. Um, and I just wanted to give you a brief synopsis of what a Downtown Development Authority is. I also have this matrix, which gives you a lot of detail about how they're governed, how they're formed, what are their powers. Um, this compares a number of different types of districts, but it does have Downtown Development Authorities, business improvement, improvement districts, um, and those are two of the big ones that we'll be talking about today. So a downtown development authority is a very flexible tool. You create a plan of development and you can implement that plan of development. Um, there's very few restrictions on what you can put in your plan of development. It does need to be in your central business district. You can access tax increment financing as well as mill levy. So if you have infrastructure projects, maintenance, things like that, this is actually a very good tool to look at. Business improvement districts is I think of it more as really driven by the businesses. Um, you can structure how the boards of these organizations fit, but this can really be um, business driven and business led. And business improvement districts function primarily on mill levy, so essentially the businesses and property owners agree to tax themselves, and this money goes in. The good thing about this is it gets everybody within those boundaries contributing and you can set up what you're going to work on. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on is Merchants Association. And it doesn't have to be a Merchants Association, but just thinking about nonprofit models. Nonprofit models are um, very traditional and in a lot of downtowns. Um, the, they usually run on a membership model, sponsorship model. Uh, membership, sponsorship, and events in terms of fundraising and, and how they are funded. So because there is no financing built in, they're a little bit less um, stable. You end up spending quite a bit of time raising money um, that is, is not spent on doing the programs that you're, you're there to do all the time. So um, that's one thing. You also end up with a little bit of what we refer to as free ridership. So not everybody has to buy in, but everybody in that area is going to benefit from the work that they do. So just thinking about those. Um, and then I kind of think of it as, you know, the nonprofit, you have absolute control. Um, the business improvement district, you, um, you, you have that mill levy and you can structure it so that the, um, the businesses and, and property owners can, can be elected to be the board. Um, the downtown development authority, because it gets tax increment financing, you have more, um, you tend to have more oversight, but both a bid and a DDA have oversight from council, certainly. Um, and so now we'll dive into our three case studies, and then we can have a lot more conversation. We have um, three speakers from three case studies, and then we also have an attorney named Tom George from Spencer Fain that we work with a lot on around districts. So we have a very educated um, group of folks to help guide our conversation. And we're going to start with Steve Glick from Downtown Golden. Um, Steve has been a proponent of a vital, healthy, and economically strong urban environment throughout his lengthy career in municipally oriented city planning, economic development, sustainability, and community development. 
Um, Steve has, is, is a leader in Golden, and um, he's going to present their Downtown Development Authority here today. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, thank you Mayor, for inviting. Um, I did speak at C the Colorado Municipal League this year, and um, after that I had to change that bio because at that point it said nearly 40-year career, and I thought, I'm not so sure I wanted to advertise that anymore, so now it says lengthy. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks so much for inviting me, and um, I want to talk to the, the folks instead of the city folks. Um, to talk about um, choices that you need to make in a decision, why we chose the Downtown Development Authority, and a little bit about how it became implemented. And actually, I'd rather use this if it works. So um, our story, everybody's story is different. Our story has to do with we had a tool. It had a finite life, um, a 25-year life for our Urban Renewal Authority that was, for the downtown project that was going to end in 2014. And it led to a lot of conversation about what are we going to do. But the most important thing, I think, for this conversation is the bottom bullet here by the end of that use of that tool, we had um, a significant program for holiday lights, which are not at all cheap, maintenance, parking management, grants for businesses, other types of programs, and we didn't know how we were going to continue them. Um, we were forced to start thinking about a decision, and we thought about the, the range of um, opportunities that Catherine just presented, but we also talked about, well, what if, what if we just had the city take over? What would that be like? And I think the, the mayor's comments about, oops, okay, go away. The mayor's comments about all the other things the city has to deal with was one of the main reasons we thought, we're not so sure that we just want to dump all of the downtown programs into competition with everything else in every year's budget. That we'd like to have something that's a little bit more sustained and defined and committed to downtown. That our downtown, um, we feel about our downtown much the way the mayor presented, that it is the socio, it is the the social core of the community as much or more as the economic core of the community, and it's, it is our identity. And so we weren't sure that we wanted to just leave it up to chance as to how things would go in the future. So um, a task force was formed, naturally, task force of um, residents downtown, business owners, and property owners, um, all three of them being very important stakeholders for us, and much of 2012 and 2013, they looked at, well, what if we just let the city take over everything? What if we do a, a merchants association, a BID? And in the end, the recommendation was to do a downtown development authority for many of the reasons that Catherine presented. It, it has a lot of tools. Whether you choose to use them or not, um, it has the ability to do many of the things that we wanted to have um, defined operations going forward, and a um, reasonably anticipated funding stream, revenue stream, so that we knew that we could continue things. And that recommendation was made by our citizens committee um, in 2013. So you've already, seen, you've already seen what it is, but what's a little bit different from other tools is how you establish a DDA. A, a DDA, um, unlike your local municipal elections where residents vote, residents who are registered to vote, to establish a DDA, it requires a positive vote of electors who include all the property owners within the boundaries, all the business owners within the boundaries. Um, there's, you would need to talk to your legal counsel about how you um, address representatives of corporations or nonprofits that are actually located in there but then also residents. Just finding out who all those people are is an interesting task. Um, your city clerk will um, 
not be thrilled to have to run this type of an election because it's different than any election that he or she would ever have run before. But that is who decides whether you get to have a DDA. Um, in, in, our, in our situation, we were looking for a dedicated organization that had dedicated funding and that we could have um, reasonable confidence that if we worked together, we wouldn't lose all the progress we had made in the decades before. Um, most of our downtowns um, that are of the age of Littleton and of Golden have a similar history, a history of um, continued improvement until after World War II and then a period of not so great times from 1950s to the 1980s. Ours got to its low point in the late 1980s and it's only been through a lot of effort and renewed interest in society in some of our downtowns that we, we had the resurgence and we believe we like you are in that growing mature period. But um, we were afraid of losing it. So um, organizational stability, economic stability, revenue stability, that's why we chose that, that route. Our city council, however, was adamant that they wanted the people, the electors downtown to recognize the decades of work that we had done to improve downtown and the amount of work it was gonna take. And so this um, second one from the bottom, approving a mill levy was important to council. Council was really only going to put a significant amount of seed money into the DDA if the electors approved the mill levy. Um, and one reason for that is that if you, you cannot rely on increment, even if you, whether you want to or not, you can't rely on it in the early years of an organization. You will need seed money or mill levy or both in order to make an organization work. So in our case, the urban renewal project that was ending was able to provide some money. The city gave some money, but um, and the DDA has just started five years into it to generate a little bit of sales and property tax increment. But the mill levy was important politically to council. They wanted downtown businesses to understand that maintaining and enhancing what we have is not at all cheap, that it takes a lot of effort to keep downtown as wonderful as it is right now for you. Um, a little bit about tax increment financing. It's popular some places, not popular other places. But one thing to note is, of course, that the base does increase every two years with the reassessment, and it's only new construction that benefits the organization. And if, if that's appropriate for you, great. If not, not to worry. Um, we really wanted to focus on a combination of a, a few more redevelopment projects that we have downtown, but a lot of it being management. Um, I, one of my coworkers is here, and I apologize, oh, I meant to say it earlier, that I do need to leave soon, but she spends most of her time dealing with um, trash, parking, holiday lights, um, fa facade information that um, businesses that are looking for advice or perhaps grants for facades, uh, website um, grants and assistance, all of those day-to-day -day things that are what helps the downtown stay, stay vital. Once in a while we, oh, and then the latest thing, our streetscape is now almost 28 years old and we spent most of, uh, not most of, we spent a good chunk of this year dealing with um, heaved portions of sidewalks around trees that once trees get to be about 25 years old, they start heaving up the tree grates around them and causing ADA problems. And so small infrastructure improvements are continuous. And the city didn't really have money to, and time to go out and deal with them. So we had to pay the city's contractor to go out and do them because we want to have a safe, pleasant place for all people to be able to, to walk. So lots of varied things that will be customized to your area. Oop. Um, it was important back in 2012 to try to describe to people well, what are the benefits to property owners. Property owners' benefits were fairly easy to describe. Their property value in part relies on the success of the tenant and the quality of the neighborhood, the quality of infrastructure. 
It was also pretty easy to demonstrate benefit to merchants. Having a vital downtown where visitors, residents, customers are attracted to is important to them. Having programs that they appreciate, having available parking that's clean and safe, having holiday decorations, banners, etc., celebratory decorations, pretty easy. It wasn't so easy up front to talk about the benefit to residents, um, especially why they should tax themselves more. And we don't have a lot of residents in the downtown core, and I don't know if you have any or a few, but they chose to be there because it's such a vital place. If you have residential mixed use, those people are choosing there because it's so vital, and hopefully you'd be able to explain to them why it's to their benefit to maintain a, a vital downtown area. Our, oh, I was asked at the Colorado Municipal League about um, boundaries, and um, the young lady had asked a, about a technical question about boundaries, and my answer was, well, boundaries are boundaries, but the most important thing, in addition to where it makes sense to define your DDA, is also where there's support. You don't particularly want to include areas that aren't invested in the downtown area, so our boundaries are strange just because they are. Um, we had to provide people what is the impact of a five mil, the maximum that it can um, create, and the impact is um, for each $100,000 of commercial property value, $145 a year, um, and for residential, a much lower amount. And as with Gallagher, that changes periodically. Who gets to vote, I already told you. Um, we ended up with four ballot questions. You, you need one. Um, the most important one would be um, the electors need to authorize city council to pass an ordinance to create the district, the authority. But um, it was, we added three more uh, questions because we wanted to get them done all at once. So your legal counsel will tell you whether it's wise to do anywhere from one to four, but um, the second one is to authorize the property tax. Um, our city council felt it was important. Um, they prob I don't know if they would have gone forward if it didn't pass, but the, the next two were just a matter of convenience. Uh, we had a question authorizing bonding. I don't think we'll ever bond, and I had a conversation with our legal counsel is, is this vote good for 10, 20, 30 years, this authorization to bond, and he didn't quite know, but it seemed like it was appropriate to see if, if we needed money for a big project, could we go out and bond it? And it, after Tabor, of course, in 1992, you always need citizen approval to bond. And then the, the fourth one was we debruced. It is important for a entity like this to not be subject to Tabor because its revenue can grow fairly fast fairly quickly, and if it doesn't have the ability to use its revenue, it's really um, boxed in. Uh, by state statute, a DDA can have anywhere between five to 11 board members. All of them must be electors, so they must be property owners, business owners, or residents within the district, except for one city councilor may be appointed. There are a number of DDAs in Colorado, and um, Hopefully you'll have a good conversation. Robin from my office will stay and be able to answer other questions, but I need to leave before nine. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. All right. Um, so now we have a, um, another really special um, speaker, um, Frank Locantori. He's, um, I don't know, I feel like you're a legend in Denver. <laughs> um, he's, been, he's been working with um, CBID, which is the Colfax Business Improvement District. So it goes from like the capital to university? Uh, yeah, basically Ish. high school. Yeah. Um, and, and you've, um, 
I'll, I'll read. <laughs> he, he has experiences with neighborhood groups in Capitol Hill, Colfax, and Uptown, which inspire him to be involved locally. As executive director of the Colfax Avenue bid, Frank has found the perfect job to blend his nonprofit organizing experience with his love of local issues. Um, come on up, Frank. I'm going to pass it over to him and let him share the story of Colfax Avenue bid. For you. Oh, wait, this one is the new water. All right. <laughs> Great. Hi, uh, my name is Frank Locantore. I'm the executive director for the Colfax Ave uh, BID or Business Improvement District. Um, I'm going to just go quickly through my slides to remember what I'm uh, going to say. And this will be an example of this is what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to repeat what I just said. Um, all right, so here we go. That's going to be a fun slide. That, that's really a fun slide, too. I see some of the text got cut off there. Okay, so um, I, we are, so the, the, that length that uh, Catherine was just talking about, it's about a mile and a half long. We're pretty much a, a real corridor, a tunnel of Colfax Avenue State Capitol on the west end, East High School on the east end, and we go from 14th Avenue to 16th, so we're two blocks deep. We've got about 400 businesses, 100 of them right on uh, Colfax Avenue, so that's what you really think of. But then on those side streets, we've got accountants and therapists and lawyers and, you know, in, in those converted homes that are right there. So it, it which is really kind of... Uh, um, a real reflection of like how we are really embedded in the community. You're just a few steps off of Colfax and you're in you know, a residential area and I happen to live within the boundaries um, as well. Um, I've been in the position for about uh, three and a half years and doing nonprofit work, uh, mainly environmental stuff uh, before that. And, um, and so um, this is a slide about this is a slide about uh, our business improvement district. And I think it's less important for you to know when we were founded and, and that kind of information. That's more of a context. But I'm just going to use this slide more as a way to um, explain like how, if you were interested in a business improvement district, how you might be going about it. But we were the second business improvement district uh, that started in the city of Denver. And if I was to try to answer the question that uh, Catherine asked of like, what do you need? Why did you start? I, you know, I wouldn't be able to answer that. And I don't even know if, if we brought the founders here together, if they would really have been able to answer it because it was so new. The Cherry Creek bid and our bid started up within, I think, just months of each other. And there weren't any other bids before that. So I don't think anybody honestly knew what they were doing or what was going to happen. Um, so, but, you know, answering the question in 2018, I, uh, the answer is, what is it that you want that you don't currently have? Um, and if you can't get that someplace else, can, can some other device or, or structure give that to you? and or help you get what you want. And so perhaps a business improvement district is the thing that you want. Um, so uh, we were founded for the most part by, you know, as Steve was just mentioning, there was a petition drive and then, you know, gathered the electors together and then there was a vote and it's much more complicated than that, but you will need to figure that out on your own. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, and then it, once one of the things that is, I think, really great about the Business Improvement District is you're governed by the people that are working and living in that area. So if you're a bus if you're a rate payer, you know, as Steve was saying, if you're paying into the bid, then you're eligible to be a board member. And who pays into our bid? Um, are the commercial property owners and the business owners within the defined boundaries. Um, so I am a resident that lives within the defined boundaries, but I do not pay into the bid. Just the commercial or business properties are paying into it. Um, the, and then from there, that's where our, we have a seven-member board of directors that 
guide the direction that we want to, that they want to go in um, or we want to go in. And so um, how we spend our money, what is that going to be spent on? What are our priorities? What do we want to be doing this year? And how do we want to be preparing for the next 10 years? Um, and and I, I, I'll pause there and underline that is because especially when you're working with business owners, right? There, you know, and there's business owners here, I think I saw fingers being pointed, but you, you're focused on making sure that your business is great inside the walls of your business, and you've got, you know, a 24-hour job for the most part. Now, if you're trying to think of, like, well, what's going to happen in 10 years and what are the trends are, you might be able to devote a little bit of time to that. But that's where I think, again, one of the values of having, you know, a paid staff person or people, depending upon your size, uh, can really add the value of, okay, what are the trends saying? Where are we going? What do we need to be paying attention to? How, what do we need to do today? How do we plant the tree today so that in 20 years we have shade? You know, these are, we, we literally just gave out an award a couple of weekends ago, uh, our second annual Characters of Colfax Award to Marty Amble, who helped start up the bid uh, nearly 30 years ago, and who 32 years ago, before the bid was even started, planted trees in front of the Irish Snug and a few blocks in that area. And now they provide, those are my favorite blocks on Colfax Avenue, because you've got patios, and you've got shade, and you've got trees. And it's because Marty and a few people 30 years ago planted trees. That's the kind of foresight that you, know, you really are, need to look for. And then in terms of funding, um, there's a variety of different ways. We're funded through a, a mill levy, so based on your, the assessed value of the property. And the one thing that I will just really underscore there is that make sure it's enough. Um, you know, for what you want. If you want, um, you know, three trash cans and five banners, then you know how much money that you need. Um, but there is a bid apparently on Old Gaylord that is basically been non-existent because they have a budget of twenty thousand dollars a year and they really can't do anything with that. So make sure that you're you're getting the resources that you really need, and then you're gonna have a mission, you're gonna have bylaws that'll be guiding what you're doing, but for the most part, it's like clean, safe, and friendly. You want the area to be a prosperous area for businesses, for residents, for the people that are coming to it. So you, you want people to be attracted to go there, you know, being clean, being safe, having a good personality. The personality that you want is going to <laughs> make a big difference. Um, so, uh, one of the things, when, when I started uh, a little over three years ago, the board kind of felt that we were waking up to a new day every day, and we didn't really have a vision, we didn't, didn't really have a plan. So we set out on uh, creating our uh, streetscape plan, which we finished um, uh, a year and a half ago. And one of the things, it was really great because one of the things that we did was that we decided to create these different focus groups and get feedback from the community and online surveys, et cetera. So SWAT, I'm sure you all know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The words on here aren't all that important, um, you know, to you anyway, they're important to us. And the larger they are and the bolder they are meant that that was the more they were said during our focus groups or in the online surveys, et cetera. So I'll, you know, I'll point out a few of them. So uh, the notoriety and the grittiness of um, uh, the, the area would, just came out over and over again. People just loved it. Yeah, it's, you know, they, they like that roll up your shirt sleeves aspect of our section of Colfax Avenue. What they're not all that crazy about is the crime and the unengaged landlords. And the, the folks didn't really use the term unengaged landlords. They used uh, slumlords, you know, type of thing. People who are just don't care about their properties and are leaving them vacant. And the, the, that causes a problem. So, the, you know, then there was, an, you know, we had other the opportunities and threats which was really interesting too, because in some cases there were, uh, it was the same concept or the same thing that was an opportunity and also a threat. And so how do you kind of like, you know, thread that needle or maybe not necessarily threading the needle, but making sure that you're taking that into account of like why, what are people worried about and how can we mitigate that? And our bus rapid transit that's gonna be going down is an example of that. Great opportunity to bring people 
you know, into the area. But what does that construction and that disturbance do to the businesses during, during the time that it happens? Oh, and it may take away some parking. It's going to take away some parking. And I'm not going to get started on that. Um, so, uh, and, and so, the, so it got, you know, job and population growth. So this is, you know, example of like, you know, again, businesses focusing, making sure that their business is great, as successful as possible, maybe expanding. But what are the trends? So on, you know, on, in the Colfax corridor, our population over the next, uh, you know, about 30 years is going to grow by 25%. Employment is going to grow by 67%. Um, you know, the, the number of car trips, single occupancy car trips are going to grow by about 20 or 25 percent and bus trips uh, uh, are going to grow by about 25 percent. How do we deal with this growth? There's no wide, even if we wanted to widen the roads, there's no widening that's, that, you can, that can happen. The buildings are there. It's an old area of Denver. So how do you move more people through the corridor to make sure that they see the great area and the bus rapid transit is a way to do that? And, and being able to kind of like, you, I've, I've spent five years on the task force absorbing all of this information and then trying to articulate it to business owners who are worried about these types of things is, you, you know, is, is a heavy lift. But if if we do nothing, we're going to strangle ourselves. And so the, the businesses are going to uh, falter greatly if we don't figure out something like bus rapid transit. Already cars are moving off of Colfax and going on to 13th and 14th and 17th and 18th. So we don't want those potential uh, residents and customers to be missing out on the wonderful world of Colfax. And so how do we make sure that they stay on there and not have to worry about parking when they go to the film more or the Ogden for a show because they can take the bus and that, that drops them off right there. Um, so this is that's the thirty thousand foot view that um, is I think really helpful at, by having you know people working day in and day out you know with the with the bid. Um, but then there's also the micro. You know, nobody is necessarily reading, um, you know, or, or paying too much attention to the macro, so that's why you want to pay attention to it. But they damn well are noticing how much trash is on the street and how ugly things might look. So, um, so we, you know, hire a maintenance company that, uh, well, we spent a lot of money to put trash cans out on the street and to put pedestrian light poles on the street so that we can put banners up, et cetera. And we spend uh, a lot of money on maintenance. Don't forget the maintenance. I, hopefully that's uh, going to be uh, very clear. Um, and then this year, because Colfax is, um, it's the convergence of a lot of different things. We've got a, probably the most densely populated area of the city. We've got, you know, I mentioned, you know, hundreds of businesses. Um, and we've got lots of things happening in terms of activities and events. We've got homelessness. We've got crime. We've got drug dealing. We've got uh, drug addiction. So please come and visit. Um, you know, I, I, uh, but uh, you, you, when I say it that way, right, it sound, it's really a whole lot worse than it really sounds. However, perception is reality. We do have those issues. They're all converging, you know, onto Colfax for legacy reasons and for other reasons. How can we figure out an innovative solution or a piece of the solution that can maybe help us get there? So Colfax Works is actually our pilot program for the summer that was supposed to end on August 31st, but it, 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 it blew our expectations away more than we wanted to. What we're doing is we're employing people who are experiencing homelessness or are emerging from homelessness, giving them a living wage uh, 24 hours a week. They're helping clean up uh, the street and also the side streets that have also gotten the 14 and 1500 blocks of each of the streets that straddle Colfax. And, um, and we're getting crazy awesome uh, testimonials from people who are loving it. The street has never looked so clean. We have these ugly gray utility boxes that every city has and we're painting them and we're putting up stickers on them that are talking about Vision Zero to reduce traffic fatalities in the area. Okay, and I am going to, you know, wrap up because uh, the last thing that I would just say is that we were able to leverage uh, one year 500, by working with the three other Colfax bids, 
we uh, built a lot of power, and we leveraged $500,000 from the city to improve our dangerous intersections. And then in last year's 2017 uh, Go Denver or, or General Obligation Bond, the R Denver Bond, we got $20 million allocated to Colfax, to eight miles of Colfax in that Go Bond that is going to be used for street improvements, for uh, streetscaping, et cetera. So this slide, whatever, it doesn't matter what it says there. What the point is, is that we have a budget of $600,000 each year, and we're the largest of the four Colfax bids. Together, we were able to leverage $20 million to put into Colfax to help improve the street. So I think that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just end there and say, and, and maybe the last thing that I would just say is that, you know, when you're, you're, if you are looking to hire staff, you know, there, I think that there's three things, you know, to really look for. They've got skills, you know, skills you can kind of learn, but having skills going into the job is usually pretty helpful. Um, but, you know, ha having a knowledge of the area, whether they live in the area or work in the area or whatever, they have that intimate knowledge. And it's not just a job, but they're passionate, you know, about that area are, are the things to really look for. Because you could just, you know, anyway, thank you. <laughs> And we do have everybody's um, bio in the information behind your agenda. Um, and um, so we can also, um, if, if you have questions for them after today, I'm happy to um, run questions by them. Um, oh, sure. Thanks. Um, so, oh, uh -huh. great. I, our, our next guest is um, Kevin Tilson from Castle Rock. And um, Castle Rock is uh, one DDA that uh, we have a, a history with. So when they were looking to form their DDA, um, DCI came in and helped bring people from other DDAs and other districts from around the state to do a panel. And they got to kind of ask questions. So their business owners, their property owners got to ask people who've been through the process in other places. And I think that that was a really good thing to help them understand why this was important and why they'd want to get behind this. Um, Kevin has worked in economic development for 12 years, working at the municipal, county, and state level. At the state level, Kevin served under Governor Ritter and Hickenlooper in the Office of Economic Development and International Trade, working to attract and retain some of the largest employers in the state. Um, and, oh, let me see. Sorry, Kevin. I wanted to see how long you've been. I don't need any more bio than that. Yeah, okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, sorry about that, everyone. And here is the fabulous Kevin Tilson. That water was not touched. I, I think I'm going to have a sip of the community water here. <laughs> Steve promised you hadn't had it. I watched. Nobody drank it. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Tilson, as Catherine said. I'm the director of the Castle Rock Downtown Alliance. And I, I thought what I would do is first talk a little bit about our structure, and then I can go through some of the things that we've done in Castle Rock. Um, but I also think, and, and I don't know if you have time planned for question and answer, um, a, a lot of times you know, it, it's helpful to just have an open discussion, and so I'm happy to do that as well. Um, inevitably, I learned something from that as well, so I'll jump right into it here. So, so the Downtown Alliance, so we've got two separate organizations that are the Downtown Alliance. On, on one side of the organization, we have the Downtown Development Authority, and, and Steve's already talked a little bit about that structure, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, but I, I think kind of the main thing that I'm, I'm here to speak to is the Downtown Merchants Association. And so we've got a, um, a nonprofit that is kind of the voice of our downtown. We're, we have a seven-member board. It is made up of seven business and property owners in our downtown district. Separately, we have the Downtown Development Authority. We were created by the town and by the electors in the downtown district. We're a governmental entity, and we also have a seven-member board of business and property owners in the district that are separate from the seven that are on the Downtown Merchants Association, and together we are the alliance. And so about five years ago when I got here in downtown Castle Rock, 
um, we said, okay, we, we want a new structure. And, and Catherine talked a little bit about working under one umbrella, and we have done that to the max in Castle Rock. And so we came in and said, okay, rather than have one set of staff that is the Downtown Merchants Association and one set of staff that is the Downtown Development Authority, we, we will do a restructuring, and we'll have one set of staff that serves the two boards. We keep a separate set of books. We have separate missions. But we force the two to work together for an active and vibrant downtown. To build on that, my two boards, the Merchants Association and the Development Authority, have a staffing contract with our Economic Development Council to provide me and, and Kristen as staff for the Downtown Alliance. So the umbrella organization that is the Alliance has two organizations within that. We share an office with the Economic Development Council and it forces us to all work together for the collective good of the economy in Castle Rock. And I, I would say beyond that, all three of our organizations go to the town every year for a service contract and get some of our funding from the town. And so in that way, I have a lot of bosses. I've got seven members of the Downtown Merchants Association, seven members of the Downtown Development Authority, and seven town council members that are my boss. And so when we try to accomplish something in downtown, it's a lot of cups of coffee. It's a lot of meetings with each of the three boards in addition to the CEO of our Economic Development Council, who then meets with his board, and it's meeting with our town manager um, to make sure that we all have this collective vision of what we want to accomplish in downtown. Um, there, there's a lot of value to that. There's, there's pros and cons. The cons are a, a lot of time to accomplish something, um, but the pros are when you get everybody rowing in the same direction to accomplish something, you can really b build momentum fast uh, because there's a lot of people that have that collective vision. And so once you can kind of plot the course for that collective vision, uh, th there's a lot of people there to, to support that initiative. Another way that we're, we're kind of joined at the hip here, when our Downtown Development Authority was formed, as Steve mentioned, we had a vote of the people. We had three ballot questions. And, and out of that, we had to set the boundaries of our tax increment financing district for our downtown for the DDA. And the Downtown Merchants Association adopted those same boundaries. So again, we are very much focused on the same area of town to, to, to try and make it more vibrant and, and make it more active. So, so the Downtown Merchants Association role, I, I, I would say we are the voice of downtown. Um, we spend a lot of time getting cups of coffee with our downtown business owners. We spend a lot of time getting cups of coffee with our uh, town council and with all of our town staff so that we have those relationships in place that when something is needed in downtown, we know who to call and, and, and how to um, work together to accomplish something in downtown. The other mission of the Downtown Merchants Association is to create great events in downtown. We are really the organization that does most of the events in downtown, not all of them, but, but most of them. And it's the goal of bringing people to our downtown so that hopefully while they're here for an event, they spend a dollar or they see something really cool in our downtown and decide that at a later date, they want to get their family and friends and, and come back to downtown. Um, you know, speaking to the importance of, of, of working together, I, I think we've got something unique. I think Castle Rock has won some awards. We, we really made a focus to work with everyone. So in addition to the Economic Development Council and the Downtown Development Authority, our Downtown Merchants Association, and our Town Council, we reached out to the Chamber of Commerce and said, okay, we all have to row in the same direction. We can't be competing for sponsor dollars or who does certain programs or who does certain projects and so we've made um, a commitment to meet weekly and so the CEO of the EDC, the town manager, the CEO of the chamber and then me representing our merchants association and our downtown development authority, we, we meet weekly on Monday to stay coordinated with everything that we are doing and that has been extremely effective uh, certainly for me in advancing our downtown because it allows me to come in and say, okay, here's an initiative that we want to work on. What am I missing? And, and if, if we all agree that this is a good initiative, uh, again, we've got a lot of people that can be out there in the community supporting the initiative that we're working on. Pam will take that back to the Chamber of Commerce and say, hey, this is what they're trying to do in downtown. Here's how we're going to support them in that effort. 
Uh, again, this is just kind of speaking to the partnership and the value of working together. I don't expect that you can read that. The, the point with this slide was just that, um, you know, at one point we had the downtown group, the Chamber of Commerce, our county and the town all kind of saying, hey, we do events and here's our calendar of events. Um, and we were the group that kind of pulled everybody in and said, okay, we need one calendar. One calendar so that it makes it really easy for the community to figure out what's going on and what, what events are occurring. Um, and and I, I use that as a, a microcosm. I would say if we were doing a development project or we were trying to, um, we, we just invested a lot of money in a park in downtown. Anytime we've tried to do something like that, we've pulled in all of the partners to make sure that everybody, everybody is on board with that type of initiative. So I'll, I'll click through this quickly here. Um, I know we're pushing time maybe a little bit here. We, we do a lot of events in downtown. Um, I, I think uh, one of the initial goals for downtown was to make it more active and vibrant. I, I think there's two components to that. One is kind of your built infrastructure. It, it, it's your buildings and do they allow the type of uses that you want to see in your downtown. Um, certainly that side of things is really the, the focus of our downtown development authority. Um, and, and so I'll speak to that here in a little bit in a minute. Um, but the other component of that is, is just having an active downtown. Um, they, they work hand in hand. The, the buildings are more successful in attracting great retailers and great dining establishments. And, and people want to live in a downtown that's very active. And, and we can show them that it's very active by having these events and, and having um, a lot of success and in, in, in community that, that occurs in our downtown. Um, I've got a few slides here on the Downtown Development Authority. I'll, I'll cruise through them quickly since Steve already touched on that. Um, if nothing else, I think the value of the Downtown Development Authority with our structure is that they pay a lot of the bills. Um, we have tax increment financing. We also have a three mil levy. We also go to the town and we ask for a match of those three mills that we get through our, our property tax levy. And it's, it's really those dollars from those sources that allow us to pay the rent and, and have staff. And, and then that staff serves as the Merchants Association. So we don't have membership dues for our Merchants Association. I, I think there's a lot of value if you can have membership dues. I think you value something once you pay for it. And if you're not paying for it, you, you haven't really bought in. Um, but it's also a heavy lift right now for our downtown business owners to pay a membership due. And when we look at it, even if you, you had everybody pay $100 a year, or $500 a year, or even $1,000 a year, that's not really enough money to do the types of things that, that we wanted to do in our downtown. And so we really needed some other funding source. In this case, for us, the, the fit was a downtown development authority. Um, but there's a lot of structures out there that, that might work for a municipality who wants to have a merchants association um, and, and have a funding source. We have a plan of development that, that certainly guides all of our activities. We, we do a facade improvement program. We do a flower box program. Um, we put lights over Wilcox. We invested in our crosswalks. We do a downtown ice skating rink during the typically slower winter months. Um, we just invested in Festival Park. Um, I, I won't go through this. M maybe the, the, the point here would be similar to what uh, Steve from Golden had said. We did what any good community or good government does when you're trying to create an organization, we created a task force. Or in our case, it was the Downtown Advisory Commission. Um, and it had a group of citizens, it had you know, members of town council, it had business and property owners, it had town staff who all said, okay, we need to evaluate what we want to be in downtown and how we want to accomplish that. Out of that, they, they selected the DDA, knowing that we already had the Merchants Association and hoping that one day the, the two would work very closely. Um, and we were able to, to accomplish that. Um, let's see here. You know, a, a lot of these things. We're, we're a young DDA. I, I think we're very much in the growing stage in Castle Rock, as, as Ka uh, Catherine put it. For, for Littleton, you, you guys have already done all these things. So I, I don't need to, to go into that. Um, there was a lot of value in us in updating our code and changing what signage could be in downtown and what uses could be in downtown and what the height of our buildings in downtown could be. You, you guys already know all of that um, and have been very successful with that. So I can kind of skip through this. There's a map of our downtown. Um, 
one of the things for Castle Rock, we, we needed people. We needed a, a customer base for our downtown to be successful. Um, the, the adage of retail follows rooftops is, is very true in downtown. Downtowns, we've looked at a lot of the retail studies, particularly some out of downtown Denver, that said, where do people spend their disposable income right now? And, and everything points to dining options. Um, and, and so we want dining options very much in downtown because then people will congregate, then people will come to spend disposable income, and, and we think everything else comes secondary. So to have a great shopping district, we believe in downtown, you have to have a great dining district first, and, and, and shopping will follow. And if you go talk to the dining establishments, they say, well, we won't be in downtown Castle Rock. Now, you guys don't have that problem, but we won't be in downtown Castle Rock until there's people. And, and so we very much needed a daytime population of office users that would support the dining establishments during the week. And we very much needed buildings that allowed people to live in downtown so that you had an evening population of people that would support the dining establishments and therefore then sh support a shopping district. Um, so this was a project that we partnered on and worked very closely with the town and the developer on. It was our first residential in downtown only a couple of years ago and it brought 12 apartments to downtown and it was a really big deal, and it's only 12 apartments. But this kind of pioneered or proved the concept, and, and shortly thereafter, we had a developer come in, and we partnered with them to build uh, the Riverwalk, which is under construction right now. Here's another photo of it. Um, it's a big building in downtown. It, it, it's really something special for us, but obviously every downtown has to figure out uh, what fits in your downtown. Um, I think some might think it's too big for downtown Castle Rock, um, I, I think I would argue that without it, uh, many of our dining establishments that are now coming wouldn't have an interest uh, because this proves that there are people there to, to, to buy goods and services. Um, I can kind of click through some of the projects. We've got a new brewery coming to downtown. Um, we've got a new church that's re really doing some amazing investment uh, back on an old building in our downtown. Uh, we have a facade improvement program uh, here's a before and after. Uh, we worked with the, the property owner of this property to invest in their facade. We matched some of the dollars that they put in to their facade. And, and very shortly after, we had Zabracci's Pizza come in and say, hey, uh, you know, would have never considered this building before, but now that it's been updated and rehabbed, um, we can see that you know, there's a commitment from the town and there's a commitment from the Downtown Alliance that downtown is going to be that dining district, and we want to get in early to be a part of that growth. Um, we just had Scalepi's move into the Old Stone Church. Um, and that, that, that's kind of a quick cruise through of what we've got going on in Castle Rock. Um, I talked a little bit about the structure. I'd be happy to answer any questions or kick it back over to Catherine if there's anything that... Um, any questions on structure? Yeah. I, you know, I think tax increment financing was, was the main... Um, driver for that. We wanted the ability to um, have increment to be able to attract developers. Um, for the DDA, we particularly liked that there wasn't the ability for imminent domain that sometimes you see with URAs and that it had to be focused to a central business district. So I think sometimes um, you, you'll, you'll hear talk about URAs and the potential abuses that might occur with tax increment financing, declaring you know a greenfield space uh, blighted, um, or, or some of those, and it was something you couldn't do with the DDA, and our council was very adamant that the DDA was the route we go for our downtown. Um, for the Merchants Association, we were kind of a spin-off of the chamber that was going to focus on downtown, and so we went the route of a 501c6, which allowed us to be a nonprofit, but also if we ever needed to, we could take a political position on certain initiatives in the town or at the state um, that might affect businesses. And, and that's worked very well. I would say we have been very reluctant to take a position on any political um, you know, bills or initiatives in our downtown. We are very much the, the Switzerland of downtown organizations in that we don't get into the politics um, in our community. We very much just want an active and vibrant downtown. So we're kind of, c c come one, come all. We just want an active and vibrant downtown. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about Festival, uh, Festival Park and how important it is to have the 
pretty large public gathering space for events? Sure. I, yeah, it, it's been very important for us. Um, it, it's something that the community has talked about for a long time, and finally, with with the DDA, we had enough increment built up that we could go to the town and say, hey, we'll, we'll pay the majority of the park, but will you partner with us and bring some funding to the table? Um, so out of the $7 million that we invested in the park, 4.9 of that came from the DDA. Um, it was very important. We went through a very lengthy public process to ask the community what they wanted, and resoundingly, it was a, a place for events. It was a place to gather. Um, the downtown business owners very much thought that it was an attraction that would help to bring people into our downtown who would then go and, and of course spend money and frequent the businesses. And we didn't really have that in our downtown. Um, I, I also think you know, we, we very much made the argument to the town council and to the downtown business owners that if we would invest in this attraction it would be kind of a signal to the world that hey we want to invest in our downtown and we hope you will too. And um, we hope that would happen over a period of time and we found that the minute we invested in the park, um, within actual months, um, we had developers that had bought properties nearby that very much needed investment, that were very much deteriorating. Um, Frank spoke a little bit about the slumlords. We, we had a few of those with, with pawn shops and every nefarious use you could think of in the building um, get purchased, and, and that will now be the Riverwalk project. And I would argue that that only came once we first kind of put the flag in the ground that we were going to invest in the park. Yes. Um, how, uh, how much funding does your EDA raise every year? So we, we do a couple of things. We, our three mills generates about $150,000. And so we go to the town each year and we ask for a match of those dollars. Um, Again, under my, my, my thought of the value of being under one umbrella, the funding we get from the town um, in a very good way um, gives them control over the projects that we take on. Um, and so I think that, that works very well, that we're relying on the town to survive, um, but we're also a separate organization, and so we get the benefits of both. Um, so together we, we get $150,000 from the three mills, we get about $150,000 from the town, and then totally separately, and, and we maintain a separate budget, we operate our ice skating rink in downtown. And so we use a little bit of the funding we get from the town to, to start the ice rink every year, and then we go out and raise sponsorships from the private sector. And so we work with our business community to raise dollars, and in any given year we probably raise $25,000 in sponsorships to support our ice skating rink. Um, so that's one, one side of our organization for the Merchants Association. We go to the town each year and we ask for about $75,000. And then we, we've gotten very good at trying to leverage those dollars that the town gives us. And we can turn $1 from the town into about 2 or 3 from the private sector who will come and sponsor our events in, in downtown. Um, that allows us to have the operation and produce the event, and then we hope that we're successful in selling alcohol at those events to, to really um, be able to fund the Merchants Association side of, of what we do. So those funding for the facade improvements come out of your out of the $300,000 that you collect? That's right. I, I think, um, you know, State statute that governs DDAs specifically says that you should use increment for your programs and projects. Um, we're a unique DDA in that we were created in 2008. It's a terrible time to create a, an organization that's reliant on growth of property and sales tax. Um, and so we actually went below our base for property and sales tax for a number of years, and so we were forced to survive just on our operating fund. Um, as we grow and, and have more increment, we will likely transition payment for our facade improvement program to using increment to do that, but right now we still just use our operating dollars um, to match the dollars that we put out there in the community for facades.
Sure. The, the correct answer is probably they manage me. Um, but I would certainly say there's, um, uh, it's a million cups of coffee. We, we spend a lot of time um, meeting and getting feedback and, and then going back and having a very transparent public meeting process. Um, I try to get our town manager to come to every one of our board meetings, and most of the time he does. We try to invite town council members that aren't just on our, our Merchants Association and Development Authority board to also come and, and feel welcome. Um, we are very much an open book. We, we try to meet with our town council members to say at any point, if you wanted to sit down and go through the, the books for the Downtown Merchants Association, Downtown Development Authority, and even to the public, we're very transparent with where we spend every single dollar and, and can defend that. So I think that's part of it. Um, and I, I think it, it takes a lot of time to just meet with a lot of people, a lot of cups of coffee, a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails that provide updates on what we're trying to do, what just occurred in our board meetings if they weren't able to be there. Um, so that when we finally come to town council or to one of the boards with a project, it's not the first time they've, they've heard about it. Um, I've tried to ask for a commitment and I've given the commitment that we'll never have any surprises. So before I show up at town council or they come to our board, they know months in advance of something, if not a year in advance, of something that we're, we're working on and trying to accomplish. And then do you together provide the, you know, develop the budget for the Merchants Association? You talked about the seven... Yes. Yeah, we, we do both budgets and, and separately, but collectively um, do the budget for the Demer Downtown Merchants Association and Downtown Development Authority. We, we now have them meeting jointly, so we will start a meeting at 3.30 with just the Merchants Association, the Downtown Development Authority will join us, usually at 4 or 4.30. We'll meet together as the alliance with the 14 board members, and then usually the Merchants Association will peel off, and we stick around and have just a Downtown Development Authority so board meeting. Separate. The Merchants are a separate nonprofit with their seven board members who are not the same as the DEA. That's correct. And then we're one staff that serves them both. And I'm going to steal the water now. Take the water, take the water. All right, so thank you to Kevin and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, so um, I think the important thing to think about is that it isn't one size fits all and every community builds their downtown management around what they need. So instead of saying this is the tool and that's what we want, I think you really look at what do you have, what are the existing groups that you have, how do you structure them. So, um, you know, places like Colorado Springs, they have both a BID and a DDA and a nonprofit that manages their public art, and then they have another nonprofit, and it's all under a partnership. Downtown Denver is the same way. Those are kind of the, the larger models. Um, but just thinking about what you, know, what you want to do as the first step, I think, is important. And then I'd just like to go ahead and open up questions with all of our speakers and also invite um, Tom George from um, Spencer Fain. As I mentioned, he is an attorney that we work with on these areas. And he can just kind of give you the quick and dirty differences between a DDA and a bid. If there are other things that you would like to, to talk about, um, then we can have an open time for discussion and questions. Um, and we will wrap up before 10 o'clock. Tom? Good morning. I don't have any slides or presentation prepared, but I can give you kind of my, my personal view of how I conceptually think about DDAs and, and BIDs as being different. Um, primarily, I think, it, you know, DDAs tend to be um, more so creatures of the municipality, and BIDs can be uh, almost fully independent of the municipality. And there's kind of a sliding scale there. Um, the significance of that is that it is really your board of directors. Um, DDAs is, uh, are, are 5 to 11 directors appointed directly by your city. Um, BIDs have the option of having appointed boards or elected boards. Um, and, and those board members in a BID have to be eligible electors of the district. Um, so it's kind of like a metropolitan district where you actually have voters and that, that vote not only to form the BID but also pass the taxes and they may vote for those directors. BIDs, unlike 
um, cities or, or other special districts, uh, your, voter, your voters are individuals who reside there, which is rare because BIDs can only include commercial property, um, or business entities that own property or lease property um, can designate an individual to vote on behalf of that entity or any individual who has property ownership or a leasehold interest in a business there. So you get kind of an interesting mix of voters and uh, maybe Frank could talk about that a little bit too of who the constituency is for that. Um, different than a DDA where if, if it's the city forms the DDA, uh, the DDA appoints the directors, your constituency is sort of just all the properties within the DDA. A um, little bit of difference there. And then the revenue streams are different. Uh, you heard about the TIF powers uh, that a DDA has. Uh, a BID does not. Um, a BID, uh, so, so the DDA powers are TIF, um, the five mills for operations, uh, and that's essentially it. Um, but a BID has not only um, property tax powers if it's voted in, um, but also can uh, use special assessments, can use assessments, and can use um, fees. Um, where we've seen this work, and I can't remember offhand how, how Frank's BID works, but um, more recently what's popular in downtown Denver and up north too is, um, particularly in a corridor, like you kind of have here in downtown, is use frontage assessments. So you can actually assess businesses on uh, how many linear feet of frontage they have. Call it $10 a linear foot or something to get to your budget point. So if that BID is going to use those funds specifically for uh, banners or lighting or trash removal or benches or other capital improvements, you can try to come up with a nexus. So how, does, how do these improvements benefit these businesses? Um, for example, a restaurant that has a lot of frontage um, and maybe has seating is going to get a better benefit from the beautification of the street. So a, a linear foot assessment might make sense. Um, DDAs don't have that same, uh, I would say, room for creativity. Um, but going back to the TIF side, I mean, that, that can be a big deal. That can be maybe a big selling point for developers as opposed to a straight um, mill levy property tax or some kind of an assessment like that. Um, BIDs also... Uh, they're, they're a little more flexible in the way you can include and exclude property. Once a BID is organized, you can draw your boundaries. Any property can petition the city to be included. Um, DDAs are a little different because you set your plan, you establish your DDA, um, you draw it around there, you, you lock your TIF in for your time period. Um, the day-to-day -day operations of them, uh, you know, essentially are, are the same. Um, your board meets, it adopts budgets, uh, it has annual requirements under statute. Um, and reports back to the city. Um, I will say the BIDs, uh, you know, I, there's the, again the sliding scale of how independent they might be from the city. Um, by statute, BIDs are still required to provide an operating plan to the city every year. Uh, it has to be approved by the city. That's where we see things. Uh, it's actually the operating plan and proposed budget for the year has to be approved by the city. So there's still uh, direct oversight from the city and uh, on an annual basis uh, essentially can control what the BID can and cannot do through that operating plan. Um, even though its, it's taxing authority may have been voted in at the beginning. Um, things like mill levy caps, um, debt limits, um, certain powers and that kind of thing can, are broad in statute but can be limited by the city. Um, those are some of the main highlights. Any questions about that? For, um, so in order to organize a BID, you start with a petition process, and that, the petition has to be um, signed by more than 50% of the owners of the total acreage and more than 50% of the total assessed value within the boundaries. But then once you get, so the approval, the formation process is that. You start with a petition. City Council then has to have a public hearing and adopt an ordinance to establish the BID. The BID then, if it's going to have revenue and spending authority, has to do a Tabor election. Um, the voters then, uh, that's just a majority vote of those who actually vote, like a, any standard election. So you can use TIFs, uh, a bid? So a bid would be susceptible to any TIF in place. So, it, you know, what I mean is that uh, it, it doesn't have TIF. Uh, abilities like a DDA unless it had some agreement with your URA or maybe an existing DDA. 
for revenue sharing back. We, we do see that. Um, where uh, if the URA is in place, the BID comes in with inside the, inside the URA, for example, their 5, 10 mils for operations or even 50 mils for debt would be ineffective because of the, the TIF cap. But we've got uh, examples where there's revenue sharing back or essentially just essentially waive that TIF limitation on the BID's boundaries to allow that to happen. So that's because anytime you have those two in place together, you know, you've got to come up with some way to uh, make that work. Otherwise, the, the BID wouldn't have any revenues at all. Uh, from a property tax standpoint, uh, unless they're using a fee or assessment. Can you clarify that, uh, that petition, uh, is that property owners or does it include also the business operators on those properties? That's a good question. A significant difference is that it is property owners only. Um, so a BID can only be initiated by property owners signing a petition um, because it is property acreage and property value. Uh, by statute, it cannot include residential at all. Um, BIDs can only be commercial property. Um, so the, the way that happens, you know, in a mixed use situation is uh, essentially, if you, you know, if you have ground floor retail and, and second and third floor or more residential, they're, they're, they may be within the bird's eye boundaries, but they're not in the taxing boundaries of the BID. Uh, and so then you also, the, your residents are not voters if they live in residential property and they're not taxpayers. It is, yeah. BIDs are organized under 3125.12 um, and uh, 1201. Um, and they are organized by any municipality by ordinance. Tom, there's the general improvement districts too, right, that, could, that would assess the residents. Yeah, general improvement districts, GIDs, uh, are another tool which uh, are, I would say, even if there's a scale of, of sort of uh, municipal control over an entity um, and they're on you know the city's here and, and independence over here GIDs are closer to the city control that and they're really I think designed for specific series of improvements of capital improvements so you would you would say you're going to repave or, or beautify a corridor you're going to draw your boundaries for that purpose you're going to assess those properties specifically for that capital purpose um, or maybe some maintenance of that snow removal trash removal um, but it's going to be limited in what it does all of those board members are appointed by the city. Uh, they do a, a work plan, annual work plan every year um, that's approved by the city. Uh, and, and they're just kind of a, in some respects, a special arm of the city for this specific general improvement district purpose. Um, whereas BIDs, on, just to contrast the two, BIDs have um, a large component of business marketing, business development, and economic development to them. Um, in fact, the statutes, the way they were written, once BIDs became a little more popular and had this ability to market, uh, do marketing and economic development, um, some attorneys in our firm and others realize, gosh, metropolitan districts could do that too. And so the statute, the metropolitan district statute, Title 32, was amended to allow metro districts to do that kind of activity too. So we've seen a lot of value in that. Um, so that's encouraging businesses to move in. That's um, advertising for events, um, all sorts of things that BIDs can do. And, and DDAs do too. Uh, I just wouldn't, I, I don't know how, how much they, they engage in that. Um, from a practical standpoint, but it's it's not necessarily geared directly for that. Whereas, uh, you know, BIDs, I think we're always thought of as uh, business owners and business people being able to promote themselves, uh, a lot like a merchant's association, but with the benefits of being uh, a special taxing district. We'll, we'll do a little bit of marketing on the DDA side, but mostly it's the merchant's association. Yeah. The dollars that we put towards marketing efforts. And in case of Golden, And that's what we see our BIDs do a lot, and Frank can speak to this too, is events is a big one, um, because they can actually host the event. Uh, it, it allows the insurance costs to be lower. It allows the vendor costs to kind of be handled. All the contracts run through the BID. Um, BIDs can also provide improvements that, that have a business development benefit, like, like signage, um, lighting, banners, benches, things like that, where businesses then can put their own names on it, um, try to unify the street corridor, 
Um, BIDs obviously can't own a sign that's got the business name on it, but they could own uh, maybe the, the, the infrastructure for the large sign that the businesses use um, for their own business promotion um, and little things like that. Uh, and then all of the different uh, marketing portions of events. I don't know, Frank, if you want to talk about that, what you guys do for some of your annual events. Uh, well, <laughs> we, uh, the, we used to, prior to me starting, we did the Route 40 Music Fest, which is a big hall and a lift, and, and the board didn't want to do events anymore <coughs> after that. So we don't do very large scale events. We do our, uh, just a couple of weekends ago, we did our, um, our annual street party uh, called Artifacts, and um, and we do our annual holiday party, and then we might do a couple of small things, you know, uh, around that. But we've been very focused on the the bigger, larger, you know, making sure that we have the vision, the BRT, you know, the streetscape, you know, plan, and those kinds of things, and, and steering, a, making the choice because we have the opportunity to do, it, but making the choice not to really focus on uh, too many events right now. Uh, I will add maybe you know unique difference between DDA and BID. We should point out is that because um, the, the the term central business district was brought up, and, and the statute for DDAs does say that that's formed in the municipality's central business district. There's some disagreement out there among attorneys whether uh, a city can have more than one central business district. So you could have more than one DDA, um, and the jury's still out on that. I think that really depends on your municipality. You could see how some clearly could have only one, and maybe some could have more than one, but. Um, BIDs, there's no limitation on number of BIDs or what their boundaries are. They're not limited to a central business district. Uh, you could essentially, um, and there's no minimum size either, so you could form multiple BIDs for different unique purposes if groups of business owners came in. A, a DDA, I think, uh, at least for Littleton in particular, you know, you need to think about that as, as the city probably only gets one because you probably have one central business district that you would use a DDA for. So it's something to think about in how you draw the boundaries, how big, how small. Um, exactly where you put it and what its purposes are, uh, then whether BIDs might make sense within that boundary for, for unique um, projects or unique sets of businesses. Um, also, I'd say both entities have similar abilities for capital projects and capital improvements, um, both um, construction and also ownership and maintenance of those. You know, the, the simplest way to think about it is just what the assessor says. Um, so a, a commercial apartment building is assessed residential by the assessor. Um, so it's residential property. It's not commercial. Same with the, the multi-story building. Um, it's condominiumized is the term they use. So ground floors assessed commercial. Each of those condos above are assessed residential. So they're excluded by definition from the boundaries of the BID. Um, and then the assessor, you know, the, the bid just poses this mill levy, sends that to the county. The county figures out. Which, which, are, which are residential, which are commercial, and doesn't tax the residential. Yeah. All right. um, well, so let's talk a little bit. What, what do you all think you need for your downtown? Is it, you know, is it more marketing, events, coordination of businesses? Is it you know, awning, signage, are there, you know, I, I think you had some large developments coming in. Um, what, what do you feel your needs are as you're doing your planning process? What's emerging as your focus for the downtown? Hmm? Parking. So managing existing parking? Creating more parking. Are you talking about a parking structure? Is that... Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, are there other things? So, um, just just thinking about parking management and a parking structure. I I, I go directly to Longmont. I'm sure you guys all do something. You you actually have a nice parking structure 
Um, I was thinking of Longmont because they have a general improvement district that actually put the parking in and then the general improvement district feeds into the downtown development authority which manages it, gets that revenue and, um, and keeps things going. How, how did you do your parking structure in Castle Rock? The structure we have, the, the county, when they built their building, we're lucky that we're the county seat. So they built a building in, in the town, in the DDA, we didn't have money at the time. Both went to the county and said, hey, can we buy a, a floor in your parking structure for the public? But, but largely that garage is just for county employees. We do have a need for parking. It, it comes down to money. Mm -hmm. uh, money and available land. Um, you, you can have the need and have the money, but if you don't have land right where the parking is needed, it doesn't do any good to have a structure. In our case, we're very long and linear. So north or south, um, that's our challenge, is, is finding a space. Like We would agree, wouldn't the parking structure be great? But if there's no available land, you can't really solve the issue. And if there is available land, parking structures can be very expensive. Mm -hmm. It comes down to money and, and how you fund it. Um, I think uh, business owners in some ways put into that through the DDA, so mm -hmm. we're putting in some dollars, and then we can go to the town with a match of that, and we're sharing that cost. I think that's the structure that is most preferred in, that in, in Castle Rock, because we all have kind of a stake where we're all putting into it, and, but lots of municipalities solve that in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you have land identified, as Kevin said, then that's, that's one way to approach it. So there's other ways that you can manage your parking, right? So thinking about communications around your parking, thinking about how you're directing people to the parking that you want to do, and then how you can connect the dots so that it's a comfortable walk from wherever they're leaving their car to wherever else they might want to spend money along the way, right? So thinking about all of the placemaking and all of the points of interest that you can put in there because there's lots of studies that say, you know, if you're walking across, uh, you know, an empty lot, a block might feel really long. But if there's all of these pieces of interest along the way, you could walk blocks and blocks and not really feel that it was so strenuous or, you know, adventurous to do so. So there's, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Some of it is communication. Some of it is placemaking. Some of it is building parking. Seems like the whole town of Arvada has a circular area that moves people around from parking areas from below to where there is parking to areas where they want to go to. I think that's one of the solutions that you might have had. They, they did, and that was a partnership from the city with the BID and the Merchants Association. I believe it might be on hold, but there are other places that are doing circulators. Um, you all have a trolley bus in Castle Rock. How does that work? How do you support that? The, the town owns the trolley. We pay through the DDA and have the trolley um, every year. Um, if, if you had a very Mm -hmm. San Francisco, mm -hmm. very populated. <laughs> Castle Rock is very far from that. The trolley doesn't work to move people around. We run it during events, and most of the time it's used as a novelty for families to get on at one point. They ride the whole loop of downtown, and then they get off at the same point. Oh. We, 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 we rarely get the, oh yeah, park out at the outlet malls or out at the fairgrounds, hop on the trolley, <laughs> every downtown business owner do we have a parking problem they would say yes and I tend to agree but I also realize that it's not forcing people to park out at the fairgrounds they drive into town and they park a block away and then they walk over to where the event is happening when parking gets really bad then the trolley can probably be more used mm -hmm. right now it's people don't choose to park out of downtown and ride it in because they can just go a block or two away and I very much We've, we've had a lot of people come in and we've looked at, we've had Kimley Horn do parking studies and the interesting 
The interesting points along the way as you walk from parking very much changes people's perception of parking. I really think that's something that we're seeing come to fruition in downtown as we invest in the park and we don't have empty blocks. The, the strip mall that I said went away that had all the nefarious uses. Now you don't walk in front of that. You, you walk in front of a really beautiful building and I don't think people think it's as far to walk even though mm -hmm. it hasn't changed the distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so part of what your downtown organization can do is really think about what those needs are and bring people together to advocate for the downtown needs. Um, there's always going to be that role of the city. So there's, there's other pieces, like I know in historical town Arvada, they were looking at, you know, where do you have 20 minute parking spots you know, like in front, of a, in front of a coffee shop or a business where you need to just quickly pick things up versus the longer and, and really strategically looking at where you place those types of things can also make a big difference for your business community. But having that downtown advocate to really dive in, do that work, make sure that you have a vision, you have a strategy, and then figure out how to get it done. Well, I know the Panasonic um, Next City project out by Pena, um, they're doing some of that. I'm not sure of anybody directly doing it. I, th I think there, there was a startup, Parkify, that was doing some trials downtown. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how, I don't feel like they were well coordinated with the city. Um, but so it seems like it's still, I feel like in San Francisco, I was reading stuff that it was working well. but. It's, it, you just can't put it in like one a block. It has to kind of be done when the road is getting repaved and you can do like every spot. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we also, we just did our annual conference in April in Boulder, and one of the things that I found out there is that there is, um, I think it's a non-profit group, but they actually, I think they're called strategic par parking options, and so we could tell our guests, you know, put in the, the location that you're headed towards in Boulder, how long you think you're gonna be there, and it will tell you the best parking option for you. And that's just an independent nonprofit group that does it. Um, but there's a lot of different things emerging around parking. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I just add some anecdotal uh, examples for parking that have been kind of creative. Is um, one an older one is um, Blackhawk BID, uh, and the city, city of Blackhawk and Central City have have serious parking challenges because of their topography more than anything. 
uh, and also the way people move around up there. So they actually, um, Rick Cronin in our office helped form a DDA up there years ago, uh, I, I believe for the sole purpose of transportation. The DDA bought and ran the Blackhawk um, shuttle, essentially, that ran that big loop around uh, Central City Blackhawk. It's since been dissolved because, only because the city took it over. Um, but that was one example of where transportation and parking issues were a big one. Um, and then uh, Fiddler's BID is a good example. That Fiddler's owns, where Fiddler's Green is, owns that parking structure um, that's used during the day for business purposes. It's open to the public, but then at night it helps with the, the concert venue. So there's a BID owning uh, a parking structure. And then we've worked with the Metro District recently that, that is going to build a parking structure. Parking's interesting because if you are willing to charge for it, you, you can fund them through revenue bonds. So you could use a BID potentially, for example, to build a parking structure, and if you're charging, and you can charge enough to just pay for it, you, you could bond the construction of that um, and pay for it through parking instead of having to, to charge your constituents or use a property tax. Um, and also a recurrent example in Denver we're working on is where we're seeing kind of a public-private partnership where a metro district's gonna build a parking structure um, that will actually um, then service the, the parks and libraries nearby uh, and the business community um, but also a grocery store that's going to use it almost exclusively for its parking. Uh, and as long as that parking is open for public use and you're not actually reserving spaces for businesses, you can still finance that through double tax exempt financing. Um, either maybe revenue bond or in that case property taxes. But um, there are a lot of creative ways to, to pay for parking um, through any of these tools and the way you really finance it, uh, maybe long term. Are there other questions or things you'd like to talk about? Right. Does everybody have a copy of the survey that was on the registration table? Raise your hand if you don't have one. Okay, I'm going to bring you one. Um, we wanted to make sure that everybody fills that out and gives us feedback um, about what you learned here, what you feel you still have to learn, what your, what your thoughts are on any of this. It's really important um, to contribute to all of the visioning process that your leadership here in Littleton is taking on. Um, so please take a minute to fill out the quick survey and leave that before you go. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you to all of our speakers for joining us and sharing their wisdom. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming out so early this morning. And um, everybody was uh, really looking interested. And, and uh, it, it shows a, a good dedication and a good focus on your downtown. So I applaud you all for, for doing that. Um, and do you want to, and any closing remarks from you all? Okay. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Mark Ralph, the city manager here. I do want to thank uh, Catherine for organizing this and Denise Stevens, too, our economic development director, for working together here to kind of put this agenda. And certainly to our mayor here for her words in the beginning and quite honestly, all at council for their dedication to this topic. So kind of look forward to what the next step might be and kind of the interest of our downtown merchants. Okay, thank you.